Well, we have uh, less than a month to go in the book of 1 Peter. November 17th is going to be the last 1 Peter lesson, so uh, that's less than a month away. And then we're going to have the following Wednesday off, because that's the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, November 24th. So uh, if you're pe- people who keep a schedule, kind of giving you an idea. And then the first Wednesday in December, which is the first, I believe, we're going to have a uh, an outreach night. We've got some stuff we'll get out to neighborhoods around here about our Christmas Eve service that night. And then December 8th, we're going to start something new. Okay, so lots of stuff coming up. Well, there's your update. But uh, for now, we are in First Peter. We've got a few lessons to go and... Um, going to cover these five verses tonight, verses 12 to 16 of chapter 4. And you see the big idea there on the board. Suffering for Christ is to be expected. Suffering for sin is to be avoided. Those are the two big ideas that we get in our passage tonight. Uh, Just to give you a a refresh where we are in this book, looking at the the book from a high level and seeing where Peter has led us through this letter. He started off by reminding them who they are in Christ. And that was the first chapter and a half, I think. Uh, they, we had all this verbiage of you are born again, you are children of God, you are stones, living stones, you're a holy temple being built up, uh, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Uh, he was reminding them of their identity in Christ. And then starting in about the middle of chapter 2, he went on to give them a a list of imperatives, things to do in light of who they are. Uh, They're a displaced people, but they're Christ's people. And as they are displaced, well, there are certain things that they're called to do, submitting to authority, uh, reflecting the gospel in their marital relationships. The way that they suffer has been a very big theme, and that's what we'll see more of tonight. Uh, in the book of First Peter. And he starts off there in chapter 4, verse 12, with this amazing statement, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. And this is uh, persecution that he's talking about. You see that in verse 14. He's talking about persecution. He says, being insulted for the name of Christ. You see it again in verse 16, if anyone suffers as a Christian, so he's talking about Christian persecution, enduring persecution because you're a Christian. But that makes us ask the question, uh, when he says, don't be surprised by this, is suffering normal? How would you go about answering that question? Is suffering normal? Are they two different answers? Okay, give an answer for both. Hmm. So is it normal? Okay, yeah, Logan just says because of the fall. So... In a fallen world, it's normal, right? How would you answer the suffering for Christ part? You said that's a different answer. Okay. Okay, it's a different kind of suffering. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. For sure, Melissa.
talking about this meaning the fiery trial in verse 12. No, fiery trial seems to be uh, specific to the context of per- persecution. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Um, well, one thing I, I've tried to uh, really think about over the last, especially year and a half, um, because through COVID's effects, uh, this new world that we're living in, uh, you know that churches have been particularly affected by certain government and even our own government and definitely certain states. Um, but just thinking about in the grand scheme of world history, it has been the norm for governments to persecute Christians. That's been the norm. And uh, for us, it's really hard to understand that because we're from here. We've lived here. It's the land of the free, home of the brave, you know. But that is truly an exceptional time in world history that we've been living in when Christians have not been persecuted. But uh, for the vast majority of our history, Christianity has actually been favored. That's extremely rare. In Peter's world, that wasn't known at all. <laughs> to have a government say, yeah, Christianity's good. We need to foster an environment of more of that. that. That's what we've known, a lot of us. But that's so foreign to them. And so in many ways, we as Americans have been living in a very abnormal time in world history. And as we've been living here, enjoying the blessings that we know around the world, there are lots of people who don't have those blessings. Jim. No. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some of it depends on, uh, definitely depends on definitions, and those definitions depend on our capacities, right? My coworker gave me a dirty look because I'm thinking she thinks that I'm a Christian and that makes her upset, and so then now I'm being persecuted because she gave me a dirty look, right? That's a really loose definition of what persecution is, for sure. Um, but yeah, it, it seems to me that Peter, when he says fiery trial, he means like real deal suffering because... Uh, when you think of being in a fiery ordeal, what are some of the descriptors of that environment that you could say? If something, if you were in a fiery ordeal, what would that be like? Say that. Hostile, okay. Okay, yeah, so go with a literal fire. Hot, hot, that hot is uncomfortable, right? Painful, scary, Okay. Start adding those, those uh, descriptors in there. Constantly threatening a fiery ordeal. Yeah. So um, that's, a, that's some real deal persecution. That's not, oh, well, I got kicked out of a Facebook group. Persecution. No, that's, that's not it. That's not it. And uh, so what Peter's doing here is reminding them, set your expectations for normal correctly. Again, verse 12, don't be surprised at this. Because if you have an expectation, well, normal is everyone's going to think I'm awesome and be my friend. You need to adjust your expectation because he's saying fiery trials shouldn't surprise you. That should be expected as a part of Christian living. And it comes upon you to test you. So what we're going to see in this passage is instead of being surprised, and if you look down at verse 16, he gives another thing, uh, another word that we're not supposed to be, ashamed. If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. So don't be surprised, don't be ashamed. Well, what are you supposed to be when you're found in the midst of a fiery trial, suffering as a Christian? Well, let's answer that question. And there are three things in this text that address that, responses other than surprise or shame. The first is testing. Here are your three responses up here. Uh, So you can see where we're going. The first is testing. And you just see that in that first verse again. It comes upon you to test you. It's for your testing. And when I think about testing, especially in this sense, there are three 
words that come to mind as to what is happening in that testing. And the first is revealing. There's a revealing going on. A revealing both to yourself and to others what's in your heart. When you get tested by a fiery ordeal, when you are suffering persecution, it's bringing to light what's going on in your heart. It's exposing things. It's burning things up that need to go away, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but then it's showing what's left. And for some, that might mean no faith at all. Remember the uh, parable of the sower? What was, what was the um, teaching about the seed that fell in the shallow, shallow soil? What was the teaching? And why does it... Okay. But what's the sun? Jesus said the sun represented what? The scorching heat of the sun represented... Persecution because of the word, he said. So the, the seed is the word. And the soil, of course, is the heart. The word goes into the heart, a shallow soil. It springs up real quick. And then when persecution comes because of that word, it poof, withers up and dies. That revealed something, didn't it? It revealed something. Okay, another word is refining. That's that song we were just singing, Refiner's Fire. Re- revealing and refining. And that's the other side of what's going on when something's getting burnt up. It's not only showing what's there, but it's also burning things away. It's the reorienting of our thinking and our priorities. Do you think your priorities would change tomorrow if swift persecution came upon us? You better believe it, right? You, if you knew that this type of persecution that they were enduring was going to happen to our church tomorrow. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> we'll all go hide out at Mark's and ride horses for fun. <laughs> no, our, our priorities would change for sure. Uh, and it would burn away some of those things that should have never been priorities in the first place or perhaps shouldn't have been going on in our lives in the first place. But either way, it's a reorienting of our thinking and our priorities. And then thirdly, it's not another R, so sorry to disappoint, but uh, (laughs) revealing, refining, and strengthening. Strengthening is the last word. What gets strengthened? Oh, there you go, Jim. Leave it to the Baptist. (laughs) Okay, I'm erasing and using that word just for you. Reinforcing. Okay, very good. And they all end in G, I-N-G? Oh, that's so cool. That's great. And, oh, this is just wonderful. Delightful. This is great. This study has exceeded my wildest expectations. <laughs> so what, what gets strengthened or reinforced when you go through trial? Yeah, that's right. Yep, absolutely. You come out the other side with a stronger faith, right? That's what the Lord's doing to his people through trial and persecution. Who, who sends this trial? Yeah, that's a good way to, to think of it, isn't it? When we think that this is happenstance or this is happening because man is really wanting to do it apart from God and, uh, you know, there's a battle between God and evil people and you know, that they're winning during persecution, but, you know, we hope that God's going to get the victory back. That's not really the picture the Bible paints, is it? But God's in charge of this. You think of what he did with uh, Israel in the Old Testament. All the nations, God was using them to discipline Israel. And he uses persecution in the life of his church uh, to reveal, refine, and reinforce. Okay, thoughts on the testing aspect of the fire? Yeah, yes. 
Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, that word uh, dependency, I think, is appropriate. Your dependency, it really deepens. Because the truth is, we are dependent on God for every single thing. But the truth also is, you feel it a lot more in certain circumstances than you do in others. Um, you know, when I first came to faith, it was the day that I lost my mom in my house on the same day. Because we were losing our house, I lost my mom because she killed herself. And so when you get that stripped away, you're feeling like, okay, well, all I truly have is my maker. Uh, but then, you know, you go on through life and you start accumulating stuff again, and you can easily slip into that mindset of, I'm just doing my thing. But every single heartbeat, every single breath, every single penny we have is because of God's grace. So a second element, uh, so we're, we're not seeing... Uh, persecution as a surprise or a reason to be ashamed. We're seeing it as testing, and we're also seeing it as an occasion to rejoice. We have an occasion to rejoice through persecution. See, uh, I'll start at verse 12 again. Don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. Verse 13, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. The uh, word rejoice there at the start of the verse is a present active imperative. It's a command. Rejoice. Philippians 4.4 Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. It's a command for the Christian. Uh, This is how we are to be in the Lord is to rejoice even in persecution. It's instruction for how we are to respond to persecution. And what does he relate our sufferings to in verse 13? Our sufferings are connected to what? Yeah, that's right. Our Savior and His sufferings. Uh, That's a very important aspect of this because these believers who have lost their homes and all sorts of things are being persecuted. They are suffering because of Christ. But they're also suffering with Christ. It's not just that I'm suffering because of him, but I'm actually suffering with him. I'm sharing in his sufferings. It's not that he's causing me to suffer all on my own. It's that we are in this together. And that's uh, an important way to think through this. And I want us to see this in the life of Peter in Acts 5. So turn with me, Acts chapter 5. We're going to start about halfway through the chapter. That's a bit of a longer passage to read, but let's start at verse 17 and read through verse 32. Would someone read Acts 5, 17 to 32? 16 verses, oh my. All right, thanks.
All right. What's, so, uh, what's something that stands out to you in this passage? All kinds of things to see. But what are some things that you're seeing? Good. Yep, regardless of consequences, we must obey God. Yeah, um, many of our brothers and sisters in the West have had to experience that by gathering for fellowship or, you know, whatever it may be. Um, you have to be ready and not be surprised. Good. Very good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Right. Bold guys, huh? Where do you think their confidence came from? That's right, yeah. The same Holy Spirit we have. Isn't that amazing? Hmm. Well, let's look at the rest of the chapter. Someone want to read 33 to the end? Okay. All right, what can we learn about the nature of persecution from this whole situation? Okay, so it's unable to override our faith. That's the important part. What else? Mm-hmm, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. There will be times when people will persecute, and you never, you didn't see it coming. There will be times when you think they're going to persecute, and then they don't. Uh, God's in control of all that, so you just obey, right? What stands out about the mindset of the apostles here? Verse forty-one: They rejoice that they were counted worthy to suffer shame. That's so backwards from how we think so often, isn't it? <clears throat> and, of course, Peter was involved in all that, and now he's the one saying, Rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings. He's lived it, and now he's encouraging them to do it, at least. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I've got that, the denying Christ three times incident at some point in the notes. Um, but, you know, what's interesting about that, when he denied Christ three times, is he was suffering as an evildoer, because he was lying. And he's saying, don't 
suffer that way, <laughs> but suffer for the name of Christ. Suffer as a Christian. If you're suffering because you are associated with Jesus, rejoice. Rejoice. But don't suffer because you brought it on yourself. So, um, he also, going back to 1 Peter 5, he also ties this rejoicing to what event in verse 13? We already talked about sharing in Christ's sufferings. But what other event is mentioned there? Yeah, what's that? That's right. So, we see, uh, looking forward to his return as an element of this rejoicing. <clears throat> the, uh, there's a tie that Peter's making here between our present suffering and our future glorification. That you suffer now for a little while, but what is to be revealed? You know, that's not even worthy to be compared to the present time. That's Paul in Romans 8. Uh, that's the same sort of idea. You're suffering, you're sharing in Christ's sufferings in this life, that you, or so that, it's a purpose, because this is leading to rejoicing and gladness when His glory is revealed. Great rejoicing. And the new, How does it read the New American Standard? Who's got a New American Standard? That last part of verse 13? There it is. Rejoice with exaltation like that. So um, that's an element of this too, is that we're looking forward to the return of Christ who is the ultimate judge and is going to sort it all out for all eternity. So in this life, yeah, you're suffering for a little while. You're suffering unjustly, just as Christ did. You're sharing in that unjust suffering. But keep your eyes fixed on what's ahead, which is the return of Christ, who is the capital J judge, who's going to glorify you, you're going to be found blameless in His sight, and you're going to rejoice and be glad even with exultation. So we keep our eyes fixed on what's ahead. Okay, thoughts on seeing uh, suffering for Christ as an occasion to rejoice? Any thoughts on that section? All right. Third thing is blessing. In uh, verse 14... If you are insulted for the name of Christ, remember, don't be surprised, don't be ashamed. But instead, consider it this way, you are blessed. <laughs> because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. We are to see suffering for Christ as a blessing. Uh, a way that this could be phrased in verse 14, another way it could be phrased is, if your reputation is attacked because of your association with Jesus, you are still just as blessed as if you weren't attacked that way. Their attack on your reputation, their insulting you, doesn't affect the blessing that you have in Christ. Because what does he point to specifically in verse 14? About our blessing, how are we blessed in verse 14? And who can rob that from us? Nobody. In fact, as we go through this process of testing, uh, what's being revealed through our testing is the presence of the Spirit. As things are burned away and we look at what do we have left, you strip away all these other things in our life, what do we have left? We have our faith, as Sandra pointed out earlier in Acts 5. Execution can't overcome our faith. And we have the Spirit of God. We have the Gospel. All right, That's a blessing, isn't it? that these things remain. We count that as a blessing. We are blessed and nothing can change that. We may have our creaturely comfort stripped away, but our true joy remains. So we have uh, the Spirit, no, right, the, the Spirit of glory and of God. Now that's an interesting way of phrasing that, isn't it? The Spirit remains through it all. The Spirit of glory. What glory? What glory? Yeah. To what? That's right, God's glory. 
You have the Spirit of God's glory. That's exciting. <laughs> okay, That's, that should be exciting. That should be encouraging. You have not an impersonal force, not a, I don't know, a, a good feeling in your, in your chest or whatever. You've got the Spirit of God's glory. That's amazing. That's right. We have total assurance, total confirmation of who we are as children of God. Well, that's, that's amazing. And it says that uh, He rests upon us. The Spirit of glory and of God, you see that at the end of verse 14? Rests upon you. He has found a place to rest on you. <laughs> that's so amazing for the Christian. We have the Spirit of glory and of God always. And so persecution, he goes on to say, we'll skip 15 for the moment. Verse 16, persecution is not a cause for shame but it's a cause for glorifying God. Okay. Let, let not yourself or whoever be ashamed, but let the one undergoing persecution glorify God in that name, the name of Christ. You're a Christian. We understand our identity more. We understand our favor in God's sight more through persecution. And those are all reasons to praise and he says in verse 16, that word Christian, which is interesting, it's the only time that word shows up in uh, this letter. It doesn't show up in the Bible very much. The word Christian, I think, is only in the Bible two other times, in the book of Acts a couple times. That's it. Um, it means a follower of Christ. So if anyone suffers as a follower of Christ, it's a reason to praise, okay? Because we're counted worthy to suffer for that name, the name of Christ. Okay. Any thoughts or questions on the ways that we are supposed to reckon persecution? Not surprise, not shame, but to see it as testing, an occasion to rejoice, and as a blessing. Dean. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's difficult because there's always the possibility that persecution will come in disguise. It'll be in the name of something else, but it's actually because of this or whatever. Um, and we don't know how all that works. And so, yeah, we need to be very careful of uh, I don't know, falling into some sort of martyr complex or something where we want to be presented as a persecuted people or something. Uh, make it out to be that way. Make, the, make it appear that way to everybody. Um, we need to be just real careful about that. And you know, we don't know all the things that are at play. So what do you do? You live for Christ. You obey God. You live your life by faith seeking to honor God and all that you do. And if he causes persecution to fall on you, then let it be, right? And so don't, I don't know, I, I really don't like it when people are really always trying to figure things out. And think, this is what's going on, this is what's going on. We just don't know. Just live your life and honor God. Melissa. It's a reality check. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
for sure. Yep. So if it happens, don't be surprised. And don't be ashamed. But just be bold and rejoice. Okay? All right, so verse 15, the one we passed over for the moment, is where he sets up the contrast. Suffer for Christ, yes, but, verse 15, let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler, or as the New American Standard says, troublesome meddler. So Peter's, oh, yeah, busybody, yeah, that's good. Yeah, Peter's saying this is not persecution. If you're suffering in those ways, that is not persecution. That's not testing from God. Like this, that's not what that is. Um, That's not an occasion for praising his name. No, you've brought this upon yourself through your own sin, through your own rebellion. That's not persecution. And he starts with murder. Isn't that interesting? Uh, I don't know. I I, I find it maybe a little hard to believe that they would be tempted to murder in the situations that they're in. Maybe they weren't. It almost seems to me that Peter was starting with something so egregious that they would all be like, oh yeah, you shouldn't suffer for murdering, and then he gets a little more mundane, so to speak, as he goes through the list. But uh, he's starting with an obvious one, you should not suffer as a murderer, okay? I I hope that's obvious. Um, Let none of you suffer as a murderer. And then he says thief, this is where we get our word klepto, in the Greek it's the word kleptos, Uh, don't be a thief, Um, yeah, it's another one where you just kind of wonder in what ways would they be tempted to steal, but there are probably all kinds of ways that they were tempted to steal, especially if they were displaced and needed certain things and didn't have the means. But he says, yeah, don't do that. Don't be a thief. Bring, a, bring about some sort of suffering that way. Don't do that. And don't suffer as an evildoer. That's a word for just general harm doing. Don't do harm to others. And that's not the first time he's used that word. Look back at chapter 2. You can maybe just look across the page there. Chapter 2, verse 12. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. When they speak against you as evildoers. So Peter's here saying, yeah, let, let that just be an empty accusation. Don't make that a reality. Don't actually be an evildoer. They're going to say you're an evildoer, but keep that as an empty accusation. And then he adds a fourth one to the list, a meddler or a troublesome meddler, which is involving yourself where you don't belong. Getting yourself involved in other people's affairs, watching, observing other people. Do you think that really belongs in this list alongside those other things? murderer, thief, evildoer, and then meddler? What do you think about that? Hmm. Yeah. Well, in a lot of ways... It's the, uh, I don't know, maybe the seedling or the sapling that grows into thievery or murderer or murdering or whatever. Um, to start out by meddling. And it's probably the most likely scenario for Peter's audience. I don't know if murdering is the most likely, but meddling, that's tough for all of us. That's, I think, relevant for all people at all times, isn't it? Uh, a temptation that we probably more frequently have. And I I couldn't help but think of 1 Thessalonians 4. Keep your finger here, but turn back to Paul's instruction in 1 Thessalonians 4, where he teaches against meddling indirectly, not as directly as Peter here, but indirectly. Someone want to read 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 and 12? Mm Mm-hmm. All right. Mind your own business. Work with your own hands. 
walk properly before the outsiders, be dependent on no one. That's a pretty well anti-meddling message there, is to mind your own business and to uh, work for yourself. And that's important in times of persecution, just as it is in other times, is to not go around meddling and, uh, like Jerry was saying, sowing discord. And you notice here, too, by the inclusion of that aspect, Peter's concern is about their conscience and their reputation being upheld, their conscience being clear, living what they say they believe. Uh, His concern isn't with them overtaking their foes. Peter's not saying, go get back at those people who are persecuting you or or try to overtake the government. Because, you know, there were uh, Jews during that time, a certain sect of the Jews were the zealots, and that's what they wanted to do, was overtake the government. And Peter's not saying, yeah, go do that. Peter's saying, live a life that reflects your faith. Don't murder don't steal, don't be an evildoer, don't even go meddle in other people's affairs. But just live your life with a clear conscience before the Lord and serve God faithfully. And I see that in Paul, I see that in Peter, I see that throughout the whole New Testament. We're not called to go conquer all these kingdoms. We're called to just live for Christ wherever we are. Uh, Because Thessalonians, they were undergoing persecution too. And Paul tells them, mind your own affairs. Work with your hands. Be dependent on no one. Okay? And so Peter's message here is don't bring hardship on yourself, but live for Jesus and let God bring trials as He desires. You should not incur suffering because of your own sin. That's not what a a Christian should do. And that's where my little note is about Peter's denial of Christ. Um, That was through his own sin that he underwent that trial. And Peter says don't do that. But we are instead to pursue godliness without which we cannot see the Lord and let the trials come as God sends them. And that's right. Yeah. It's just suffering, right? It's, uh, it's fair, uh, just. Whereas uh, suffering for Christ, that's unjust suffering. Okay. General thoughts or questions on that passage? Jim. Uh, There's a proverb about that. Yeah, yeah. Hmm, yeah. Yeah, it can be hard to discern when to get involved and when not to get involved. And it can be painful when it turns out you're on the wrong side of an issue. Yeah. Hmm. Other thoughts or questions to share or to ask? Okay. Well, you see, next week we're going to start with this verse, verse 17, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. Wow. That'll be an interesting one. Well, let's spend some time tonight praying. Um, I'll take some prayer requests, and then we can spend some time together bringing them before the Lord. What's going on? What can we pray about?